I've seen it before. I've seen where Brother Caleb put on his Facebook about how Kermit the Frog was sitting a little funky, and he said something about how church folk visitors are whenever they come to a Pentecostal church. Amen. But, you know, I was thinking a little bit about that, and I know how that feels. I wasn't raised in a Pentecostal church either. At best, we may have made one service every once in a great, great while, maybe an Easter or something like that, but that was a very rare occasion. And uh, I got to thinking about it tonight. You know, I've never, I mean, there might be something that I don't know about, but I've never seen one of these publishers clearing house where they won some great prize of thousands of dollars. I have never seen them people keep their emotions under control. Huh? They'll cry. I've seen them jump up and down, and grab the person that delivered the check to them and about squeeze them in half. Huh? You see, it's people that get all excited about winning the lottery and all this kind of stuff. Folks, this right here, it's an eternal thing. And it is greater than any money could ever afford. Amen. You know what happened to me? I come to a Pentecostal church and I got to thinking, I don't know whatever they're feeling, but whatever it is. I mean, this was before Starbucks and Red Bull, folks. Monster drinks. Huh? I'm like, whatever they're feeling, I want to know what that is. It don't make a lot of sense, but I'm <laughs> I don't know. But I tell you what, whenever you get to feeling the supernatural power of the Almighty God, it's hard to contain all that. Come on. Like I think Pastor Smith may have said a few times, it's hard to dam up Niagara Falls, ain't it? Amen, it's hard to. I'm glad for the presence of the Lord. Appreciate you young people here tonight. We're going to be reading out of the book of Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 6 and verse 7. If you have it, say praise the Lord tonight. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. What does he say? Rooted and built up in him. We've looked at this before, but I like this. Rooted and built up in him. And established in the faith. That word established means to be rooted or established in the faith. As you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. Amen. We just stretch a hand of the Lord and let's pray for the will and the anointing of God tonight. Father, tonight we depend heavily upon you. Without you, we're absolutely nothing. But with you, we're everything. I pray, God, for that fervent anointing that makes preaching edifying to the body. And I pray, God, tonight that you'll speak to our heart. God, help challenge us tonight. Give us a purpose and reason to know that we need to be in prayer and in the altar. God, bring conviction. Allow your perfect will to be accomplished, and we'll give you praise. In Jesus' name, everyone can say amen. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. With the help of the Lord tonight, I'd like to preach a, a very sincere, serious topic or thought, if you will. I want to preach tonight on Are You Root Bound? Are You Root Bound? I don't typically preach from a question form as a title. I once heard somebody say that it's theologically, professionally not per, uh, correct or what have you to preach a question as a title. Well, guess what? I don't fit everyone's fancy. I'm a little bit different, and I do things the way God tells me to. And I didn't go to a cemetery or seminary to get my education. I just got what the Lord gave me, and I ask him to anoint what God gives me. But I'd like to preach tonight with the help of the Lord on are you root bound? Does anybody know what root bound is? Let me see your hand tonight. Some of you planted a plant. Well, we're going to look at it tonight for just a little bit. Those that maybe you never went to the horticulture class, maybe you never planted much, maybe you didn't work in the garden center when you was in high school or what have you, but you'll find out before this is over with tonight what exactly it means. When we look at our text in Colossians chapter 2, it gives us an image of a tree or a plant whose roots are strong enough that deception, false doctrine, opinions, or the other pressures of this life cannot uproot it. 
And we're supposed to be that kind of plant or that kind of tree. How many would say tonight, God help me to be the kind of tree, the false doctrine, deception, the opinions and pressures of this life cannot uproot me. Is that the way you feel tonight? You see, we're going to take a closer look tonight at roots, which nourish and they give plants its strong foundation. If you don't have a good root system, when the rains come and the floods and the strong winds, winds begin to blow, that plant or that tree is going to come right up out of the water, right up out of the dirt. I've seen times whenever that there would be a flood, and that root system of that tree wasn't very strong. And because the water got into the dirt and it saturated the ground, the weight of the actual tree began to become so great that the roots couldn't hold it up, and it began to tumble down. I don't want you to think tonight that we can go on this race, just live any way that we want to and somehow we're always going to maintain the victory of God in our life. I would have you to know tonight that if you'll maintain what God has given you, you'll be a victorious child of God. There's just no way around that tonight. I don't care what the devil throws at you. You may stumble. You may falter. You may have times that you disappoint your own self. But if you will work to maintain what God has done in you, I can promise you that that you can live a victorious life in Christ. Can you say amen tonight? You see, Christ doesn't just want us to have roots. He wants us to have healthy roots. You see, that's important to understand tonight because the way that some people would preach it is that as long as you've got roots and as long as you've got a lot of roots, that you're going to be fine. But I would have you to know tonight that unless you've got healthy roots, that plant might be on its way out. Can you say amen. There's certain bacteria, fungus, disease, and whatnot that can get into the root system of a plant. There are even insects, there are bugs, and other types of critters that can get underneath the ground and eat up and eat away at the root system. I don't care if the roots are six foot and the plant's only two foot wide. If there's something that comes along and begins to eat away at the root system, you can have the greatest roots there are as far as large and capacity, but if the roots are not healthy, that plant cannot survive. Can you say amen? Amen. If the roots are not healthy, the plant's not healthy. It's pretty simple tonight, but if the plant's not healthy, it's much more vulnerable to all the different things that can come against it. Now, you might think to yourself that you need a simple answer to a complicated problem, but listen to me tonight. The spiritual things that we cannot see with our eyes are going to be explain right before you're hearing tonight. You see, sometimes the devil comes at us, and we wonder why that it is that we cave in under pressure. Why did I give in to the devil like that? How did the devil come over me so easily? And as I've said over and over, why did the devil get me with that same old left-hand jab he always gets me with? You might wonder to yourself, why is that? Can I tell us tonight that there is a lot of credibility to what I'm telling you, that if your roots are not healthy, and if that trunk or that stalk is not healthy, that tree cannot withstand the attack that will be that will come against it. But I can tell you this: when you're maintaining your spiritual walk with God in prayer and with the Word of God, and being in the house of God, hearing the songs of Zion like we have tonight, when the attack of the devil comes against us in the evil day, we are able to withstand stand it because his grace is sufficient. Can you say amen? And his strength which has been infused in us in our time of trouble, in our time of dismay, is able to hold us up. I think a lot of times, come here Brother Bill for just a quick moment. I think a lot of times that when we're going through a, a valley or a trial, just turn around face the other way and you're just, just walk in place. Don't go nowhere, just kind of walk in place. A lot of times we're going through a bunch of junk. Anybody been through any junk? 
two or three. Anybody been through any junk tonight? Been through a lot of junk. And uh, the enemy's come against with a lot of junk. And sometimes you wonder, how am I going to make it through? You see, sometimes we think that grace is there to just carry us. Grace is not just there to carry us, folks. Uh, amen. When we think of grace, we must understand that God wants us to be able to walk on our own as far as everyday life and make choices and make the right decisions. But his grace is there should we fall. That's the reason why. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Somebody say amen to me. And so what I see God's grace as being like is that when we're going through this valley and we're walking and we're doing everything we can and it seemed like the enemies brought an onslaught right out of the flames of hell and we think, God, how am I going to make it through this? I'm kind of weak at my own spiritual knees. Just kind of act like you're weak at the knees. And your legs are kind of going out from under you at times. And you think, God, I just can't do this. The preacher preaches so high, I just can't live it. The church's expectations are much more than I can do on my own. But you see, grace is there in the times that you fall down. I just fall. And grace is there to get you. Amen. You see, I'm glad tonight uh, that God's grace, you can be seated, is right there in the times that we need it the most. Uh, grace is there to soften the fall. Grace is there to catch you when you stumble. I'm glad tonight that God's grace is so good. Can you say amen? But you see, it's our job to make sure that those roots uh, are being taken care of. They're watered by the word of God, watered by the spirit of God. You may have gone to church before and you think, man, I didn't get much out of it. But you may also walk over to a plant and pour a cup of water on it and it may not act like that it's very, it's doing very much. It may not bloom all of a sudden. It may not branch out all of a sudden. But you see, had it not been for each and every time that that plant received a little water, it might not be alive today. You might say, well, I didn't get much last Sunday night. Honey, you keep coming to the house of God uh, because that little bit of water that you get uh, it might be an ounce uh, it might be a gallon it might be a bucket uh, but you better thank God for every time uh, that God's really watered those roots uh, and kept you alive uh, even when the storm was blowing and you still had faith uh, even when the enemy fought and you thought man I'm going down and the storm came and you stood strong and you say God how did I get here and you knew it was God all along Give the Lord a hand of praise tonight. How exactly does this parallel with the life of a Christian? Well, you see, time and space would fail me tonight to tell of the many people who have embarked on this Christian journey and they have fell away because of their inability to get rooted or stay rooted. Come on, somebody. By the show of hands, those of you that have been in church, how many of you since you've been in the house of God have seen anybody fall away? Huh? Look at all the hands. Some of you ought to be able, like I said the other night, raise your hands, your toes, your toenails, and everything else because you know that what I'm telling you is the truth. I've watched people come down to an altar on a Sunday morning. The power of God so strong, conviction so thick, and you feel it in your spirit, and they pray, and they cry, and yet, but they don't continue to go. They don't continue to pray, and their roots don't get maintained. And the next thing you know, three months later, they're on the prayer list. How many says tonight, God, please, don't let that happen to me. You see, that's the enemy's job to bring stuff into your life as a distraction to get you off your course. What do you mean, preacher? I'll tell you this. If you're experiencing God's help, I promise you that as sure as God's trying to help you get up where you need to be, the devil's got a plot even when God's got a plan. Come on, somebody. He's going to do everything he can to get you so busy you ain't got time to serve God, to get you so far away you can't get to God. Come on, somebody. What do you mean, preacher? I'll tell you this. The enemy will try to push you back, get you away from the things of God, the people of God, but you've got to stand on your feet and say, Get devil, you're not taking away what God's beginning to do in me. I feel like God's beginning to flurry 
place and blossom in my soul and you can't have what God's doing in me. Can you say amen? You see, you got to make up your mind. You can't let the devil just come along and take everything God's been doing for you. Say amen, somebody. Huh? Amen. If somebody came along and gave you a million dollars, you're going to let every crumb cruncher come along and just take it away from you? Would you just stand and look at them? You watch that. How much did they just take away from you? 100,000. You let them come up and take it from you? Yeah. Why? Sometimes I wonder the same thing about the people of God. Right, I'm going to tell you something. When you stumble and you fall on your face, pray for me, Sister Marcus. i got a long way to go, and I feel like preaching tonight. I just feel like preaching. Hallelujah. When you stumble and you fall flat on your face and you're in an absolute mess in your life and everything's falling apart and the time that you need God the most and like I said, you know, your bottom lip's hung up on the front of your tennis shoe and you're sagging and bagging and dragging. They're like, I ain't making it. Oh, God. I tell you what the devil wants you to do. He wants misery, loves company. Find somebody else that's upset about the church, somebody else mad at the preacher, somebody else don't like the way it is find somebody else that's doubting the word of God well you know the Bible did say this and I don't understand that him in misery loves company and the devil will do everything he can to talk you out of what the, the Lord has done but in the worst time of your life when you need God the most is when you try out and you exercise the faith that God told you that he gave you and all you need is just a little mustard seed grain of faith to say to that mountain get behind me in the name of Jesus. Huh? Come here, Brother Steve, for just a minute. You know, the devil wants you to think that you haven't been saved long enough to have the authority to use the Bible against the devil. I just want you to look like you're visibly shaking, okay? They can laugh at you. That's all right. You're helping me out. He's visibly shaking. His nerves are frazzled. He's a mess. He's got so much stress on him, he doesn't know what to do. Amen. That's right. But you see, what you have to do is you have to remember. You know what? A lot of times folks get in this position, they'll say, well, maybe I better call the pastor and listen, call me, call me, call me. And if you don't get a hold of me, leave a message, and I'll try to get back to you after the sound of the beep. But listen to me, folks. Amen. Sometimes you may not be able to go over the pastor. And what God wants you to understand, he said in Luke 10 and 19, one of my absolute favorite scripture. Anybody know what it says? Amen. Anybody know what the Bible says? Luke 10 and 19. You see, when we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and you understand that when Adam and Eve lost out in the Garden, they lost their dominion, and they lost their power with God. You see, they had dominion. They named all the cattle. They named all the beasts. They had it all. Man, they had it going on like we say today. They had the power. But you see, when that slithering serpent came along and deceived Adam and Eve and they lost out and God put them out of the garden, they lost their dominion, their power. But I read in the Bible in Luke 10 and 19, you see, after several thousand years, even though the devil had a plot to destroy Adam and Eve in the garden, God said, hey, I got a Messiah, my son of God. My son, he's going to come, born of a virgin birth, born in a manger, and he's going to live 33 and a half years. He's going to become victorious, and he's going to show you that my man that is clothed in the flesh, filled with the Spirit of Christ, can defeat the devil on his own turf. And that he did. But you see, in Luke 10 and 19, it says, Behold, in other words, listen, take heed, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. When you're frazzled, I'll tell you what we hear. God has given me the, given me some, God's given my pastor some power to tread on serpents and snakes and squirrels and over some of the power of the enemy, and uh, not too much stuff will harm you by any means. That's probably in the message Bible. You folks stay away from that stuff. Like uh, Tim Hawkins said, I think the, the recipe for Rice Krispie Treats is in that Bible too. Huh? 
<laughs> but that's what the devil wants you to hear because he don't want you to believe or to know that you have power over the devil. So you're just a frazzled mess. You're still shaking. You need a nerve pill somehow, they might think. Oh, God, look at me. I'm a mess. And listen, sometimes I get that way myself. Sometimes the enemy throws so much stuff. But it's at that very moment that you have to take authority. I want you to just take your foot and put your foot down like that. Put your other foot down. Like you're getting tired and sick and tired of the enemy. How many knows how they do like a linebacker on the front line? And they're going to defend their the ball, they're going to make sure the quarterback can't get, ain't going to get tackled or whatever. I want you to just kind of get hunched down like this, like you're getting ready to get into a fight with the devil. You see, sometimes you got to stand your own ground, and you got to say, you know what, devil? i got a whole lot to fight for tonight. You can't have what God's done. I'm still telling you, you got to maintain the roots. you got to protect what God's given you. i preached it many a times before, but when I see Shama standing in that patch of lentils, the Bible Bible said that David had mighty men. One of those mighty men was a man by the name of Shammah. Shammah stood in a patch of peas and he defended that whole patch of peas against an entire army of the Philistines. I can see Shammah, Shammah down like this. Come on. And he's standing there. And sometimes you may wonder and say, what have you got to protect? What is it you going to, what are you protecting? What are you, what are you fighting for? Stay right there. Come here, Carrie. You're his daughter, right? So come on over here. I've already remembered her name is Karen. She's 22, so y'all have to. I need a. I need a certificate. <laughs> and I had to. I had to make sure. I'm pretty sure you was his daughter, but I just want to double check. You know, stand right over here behind him, right here. Hmm? Where's your wife at? Okay. Now listen to me. You see, what you got to understand is when you're protecting what God's been doing in your life, you think, well, I'm just, all I'm doing is just me, and, 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 and if I lose it and I just fall out and turn back and give up the fight, well, just woe is me, and I just won't go to heaven, and that's all there is to it. But Shama understands that he's in a patch of peas for a purpose, and there's something that he's defending. Because right behind you is something worth fighting for. And right behind you is somebody that's watching how you're handling your problems. Stand, somebody stand there watching how you maintain your roots and what God has done. And if you say, look, what God has done to me is so valuable, I don't want the devil to disturb it. Listen, I want to tell you something. I ain't standing there. I preached a while back about how you got to be careful when you transplant a plant from one location to another location. If you damage the roots to the point uh, that you make a mess of them, uh, that, that plant sometimes can die. You replant it, it'll go through transplant shock. Uh, and you understand uh, and that we have to take into consideration that we can't afford uh, for the roots to get damaged, uh, can't afford for them to be destroyed. Uh, and so you got something worth fighting for. And so in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of your trial, and then the enemy's coming in with everything he's got. You stand there and think, you know what? Do I quit or do I go on? Do I stop or do I fight? Have I got anything worth fighting for? It's at that time. Stand up, Brother Steve, and turn around just for a brief moment and look and see. You've got children. You've got grandchildren. you got a wife. you got a family that's dependent on daddy to be the head of the household, a man of power, a man of anointing. And I tell you, it ain't got to be just one. We need more godly men. We need more godly women who will protect what God has done in their household. Can you say amen? Somebody lift your hand and give God praise. You just sit down. Sometimes we look at our mess and we think, God, how are you going to fix this? I made a mess of things. Let me tell you something. If you're not concerned about it, it probably ain't going to get no better. But I can tell you, if you get a concern about it, you'll understand that it can get better if you want it to get better. You see, the very word bound from root bound is contrary to the Christian experience. After all, the Bible said, whom the Son has made free is bound indeed. No way. Come on. Don't throw nothing at me. That's not what it says. Whom the Son has made free. Come on, preach it out. So what the devil wants to do is when the chains come off, come here, son, for it's over with, I'll work my way all the way to the back. 
when the chains fall off, just act like the chains fall off. He wants to come back around and get you wrapped up again. And y'all tailed up, twist your leg around. Y'all a mess. He gets y'all talking crazy. Well, I just got mad. I'm, just, I'm just so sick and tired of this. I just. Blah, 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 blah. Ever, anybody ever talk crazy? Come on now, don't lie to me. You're in the church. Huh? Anybody ever talk crazy? I just forget it. Just. I just so sick and tired of this. And you know what he's doing? He's just trying to wrap you. He's trying to wrap you up tangle you up and get you right back where you were bound up in the first place. Right. Right. Anybody ever heard the term resisting arrest? Huh? I don't want to know. <laughs> I just don't want to know. Save that for another day. Maybe a testimony. I remember whenever my kids growing up, you know, one of the things they like to do, they like to run in a bedroom and they like to dog pile daddy. And daddy took great pleasure in letting them all pile on me and then throwing them all off. Because it made me feel like I'm dead. <laughs> but my daughter, of all people, Come on, preach. my word, have mercy. She was like a wild cat. I don't, she would bite, kick, claw, pinch, scratch, dig. I don't care. And then she act like she retreat and come back for more. That's right. And every time I put my foot up, and she'd get mad if she couldn't get to me. Oh, that would make her real mad. She turned red in the face and then come back. And I said, "Okay, playtime is over, because it ain't playtime. Now you're mad." But you see, she wasn't going to let dad get one up on her if she could keep from it. Because every time that I try to, you know, put her arm behind her back or something, she wasn't just standing there letting me do it. That's right, come on. Heaven help us. Come on. I'd love to see some children of God when the devil's trying to get you wrapped back up right back where you was before. Now, wait a minute. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. You know that you know you know you don't want to serve God. Come here. Come, 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 come back over here. Did you just push the devil back? You know, that's Bible. He said, submit yourself unto God. Resist the devil. I know these modern day lukewarm, weak need preachers are telling you, just resist the devil. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and then he'll flee. Amen. If you ain't got a right relationship with God, I don't care how much you resist the devil, but if you put up a fight and you say, no devil, you're not going to get me bound up with that again. I mean, after all, I don't want to have to be lying when I get back to church Sunday morning and they start singing, he set me free, he set me free. Because you'll be standing there, and if you try not to lie, you'll be singing, he set me, he set me. And he broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory. Because you can't say he set you free. Because you let the devil come right back and put every stupid chain back on you that God took off of you. Amen. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to encourage you. You need to say, devil, I realize that what God's done in my life is something of value. And devil, you can't have it. Somebody shout praise the Lord tonight. I want to explain something to you for a moment. How many are bearing here with me for five minutes? Let me see your hand. Okay, now I got an hour and a half right there, just about a handful of hands right there. In my modern day planning, listen to me, a pot becomes what I call a pot prison. Anybody ever put a plant in a pot? What are we in the 30s? <laughs> Who's going to help me out here? Anybody ever planted anything? Or y'all just buy everything from Walmart, folks? <laughs> Do you know that that pot 
can become a type of pot prison. What do you mean, preacher? Well, if the planter doesn't keep up with the needs of the plant, it can quickly become root bound. You see, what root bound basically means, and I'll preach this out a little bit more, is when a plant's roots no longer have room to grow inside the pot. You see, when you start off, you may start up with a Dixie cup with a little seedling inside. And after a couple of weeks, that might be sufficient room for the roots. I'm going to preach this out. Y'all just hang on to your belly, your britches here. Hey, Amen. Hey, Amen. That cup might be enough room for a couple of weeks. And then it begins to grow a little bit. And then you got to take it out of a Dixie cup. And then you might have to put it in a mason jar, a mug. Come on, that's what we do around here. We just use whatever we can get. And, uh, and so, well, some of y'all, the rest of y'all go to Walmart. But anyway, you put it in a bigger pot. Come on, somebody. You put it in something that's bigger so the roots have more room to grow. You put it in something bigger so the roots can grow out. You see, if you don't do that, the roots just continue to grow out. I may get ahead of myself, but I'm going to preach this with the Lord's help. I read from one credible source that said that when roots begin to get root bound and the whole you ever pulled the pot off, amen, the, the shell of the pot off, and it's like the roots are just wrapped in circles inside the pot. My God, I said, that'll preach, uh, because what happens is uh, the roots begin to look for places uh, and ways to expand and to get out, uh, and sometimes you'll see the shoots uh, of the root go through the little leak holes uh, or the water holes in the bottom of the pot. Y'all still with me? Amen. Uh, sometimes uh, it said the roots will even grow up uh, over the lip of the pot in search of trying to find room to grow. I thought, God, I've seen a whole lot of Christians uh, that are root bound in a spiritual sense uh, because they go so far. You see, a root, being root bound, uh, it basically means uh, that there are barriers, uh, there are walls that keep the roots from going any farther. And I said, oh God, uh, you see the roots, they go so far and they come up against the side of the pot and they go in a circle. Amen. They keep on growing but they're just growing in circles because the edges of the pot won't let them get outside of it. And I tell you here tonight, some of you may still be growing, but you just might be going in circles and you haven't grown really in a spiritual sense and you're root bound. How many would say tonight, God, help me not to be bound up in my roots in Christ? Can you say amen? Preacher, you mean to tell me that I might be root bound tonight? You see, a lot of times we preach about not growing. And you see, growth is a movement. I sometimes see church folks making forward movement, but they're not growing spiritually. Can you explain it a little deeper? Well, let me take a shot at it. Okay, that's like coming to church Sunday morning. Hey, sister, how you doing? Sisters, yes and no and maybe. Hey, sister, good to see you. Oh, help me, Jesus. I hope I get blessed today. Oh, and you sit through a whole entire service and you're making forward motion and all you're doing is you're just continuing to grow in a circle. Boom. Hitting walls. Amen. I'm going I'm to get a little bit ahead of myself because I got something I got to preach out, but I have told people in the past, I said, if you ever get to a place, a church, anything's possible when it comes to the will of God because God is in charge, but if you ever get to a place where you go to a church where that you have a talent or the potential of a talent that God has called you to use and you cannot use it, you need to get down and pray whether you're in the right pot or not. I didn't get a lot of amens, but that's the fact. You better get down and pray whether you're in the right place or not because it is my belief, and some of you have already experienced this, my opinion is, is that every single person has something within them. Sometimes there are certain things in their life that a pastor cannot use a person because of their attitude or because of their personality or something that's in the way. But when you get right with God and you get good and sanctified in the altar and you're making forward motion in Christ, you need to be in a place where that you can 
grow and your limbs can go out and you can flourish in Christ. Can you say amen, somebody? You see, spiritually speaking, there's a lot of people that have looked around them and said to themselves, you know, Pastor, I don't understand why that I go to church and I don't feel like I can get anything. I feel like it's just become a habit. I just go to church. I sit there. Sometimes I enjoy the singing. Sometimes I enjoy the preaching. But when I go home, I don't go home any closer to God than when I went. Listen, if you've been in church for all these years uh, and you still ain't sanctified, still ain't baptized in the Holy Ghost, uh, and you ain't being used of God in any fashion, it is time to get out of the pot and find a bigger domain. Can you say amen? You see, what we got to understand, as one credible source put it like this, these roots will begin to grow in overlapping circles that follow the inner walls of the container. But it also says that it's important to note, unlike the top growth of the plant, roots will not stop growing in circles unless we break them and spread them out. I found that very interesting because spiritually it applies. You've heard the old songwriter sing things like, Break me, mold me, shape me, make me. And you say, God, break me, shape me. God, put me back on the potter's wheel if you have to start all over with the clay. You see, in, in this line of work, most every credible source will tell you the same thing. When the roots get root bound, they start wrapping around the root ball. And what you have to do, you have to literally take the roots and begin to pull them apart, separate them. Hey, Amen. I thought about women when they tease their hair with a little comb, you know, because it said you got to tease the roots. I was going to try to find a spiritual way to do that and preach it, but I couldn't find none. But you got to tease the roots. In other words, you got to fray the roots out, and so that the roots can begin to find a way to start growing again. Because what happens is. Uh, are you ready for this? You can get in such a religious cycle that all you know, go to church Sunday morning, right, hear three songs and a special. Oh, boom. Oh, pray two times during the week. Pray over my food. Right. Clap my hands when the choir is singing. And this is all you know every single week. And you get, you get wound tight in the pot. And what you've got to have is for a revival, a shaking, a stirring, where that God comes by and he takes your roots and he begins to pull them apart instead of you going round and round and round in circles. God breaks you up in revival. He begins to stir you and instead of you going in circles all of a sudden your roots start branching out. God starts dealing with you about stuff you should have got rid of 10 years ago. Things you should have done and served God 15 years ago and all of a sudden you start saying man there's freedom in knowing Jesus. Come on somebody. Somebody may say I'm bound as I serve God. Let me tell you this is the freest way I know. I'm not bound to drugs. I'm not bound to alcohol. But I am free, free indeed. Can you say amen? Amen. You see, there's three things I want to preach to you before I close tonight. Three things. If you didn't get nothing tonight, I sure hope that you get. Three environments. Three environments like a pot that are causing a spiritual root-bound condition. The three environments, number one is our home environment, number two is our church environment, and number three is our social environment. You see, in our home environment, if the things within our home life don't make room for spiritual roots to grow, you can't blame God you're no closer. I'm not going to say no names. I was somewhere the other day, and I noticed how evidently, help me, Jesus. Let me put it this way. I, it was Pastor God, be careful what you say. Let me just say it like this. If you're sitting around watching Chucky, yep. and uh, 
It's been so exorcist, chasing spirits, and you got time for all that mess in your home, and your movie case is slapped full of junk, and your TV favorites is slapped full of junk, and all you do is sit around and feed your spirit junk. Don't look at me and blame it on God. Come on. That you ain't nowhere near where you need to be. You see, if I walk over to a plant and I pour acid in the top of the plant, pretty soon that plant's why well, ain't going to take long. It's going to die. And you what you think, well, God, you know, uh, you know, this environment at home, it's okay if I do what I do in my own private home. I've heard people try to use that excuse to live and do anything. They were, I'm not bothering anybody. This is my house. This is my home. But let me explain to you the reason why it's important. There's an atmosphere. There's an environment in your home. And in that environment, you are either grow or either you're going to go backwards. Come on, somebody. And the things you watch, the things you allow to be in your home, the things you allow to go on, the conversations you engage in. Come on. It's in that environment you're either going to prosper or you're not going to prosper. And tonight, there's a lot of folks coming to the church and they get disgruntled because they didn't get the supernatural high. The singers didn't sing them high. The preacher didn't preach them high. The altar service wasn't high enough. So they leave in the disgruntled because they're not feeling like they're getting everything. Listen, church is not the only environment that God expects to be able to move in your life. Hey, man, what are you saying, preacher? You don't have to be Amish to have prayer in your own house. You ain't got to be religiously legalistic to have a prayer closet in your house, to have a place where you sit down and read the Bible. You don't have to be legalistic to have devotions. Come on, somebody. You just got to be dedicated, consecrated, and you want God to move and bless your life more than anything else. If all you do is sit around and feed your life with junk in your home environment, I'm going to tell you the reason why that you're just going like this. Huh? You see, somebody, somebody has to make a decision to make the necessary changes. That's right. My granddaddy, he's not alive anymore, but when he was alive and my wife had been saved and she had prayed for me to be saved, she went to my grandmother and grandfather. They were in church, and she began to pour her heart out to them and say, I don't understand. I don't know what to do. He's hard-headed and stubborn, and I'm trying to get him saved and in church, and he don't want to serve God, and he don't want to do this, and he won't do this and that and the other. And my grandfather told her, said, Honey, said, I know the Bible said that when a man is a, your husband is the head of the house. He said, But sometimes, he said, You, whenever it comes to spiritual things, you got to put on the pants of the family, and you got to start making some decisions. Don't wait on your backslid husband. Don't wait on your lost husband or your lost wife. Don't wait on them to start making decisions to do the right thing. Come on, somebody. Hey, man, we got parents that wonder why their children grow up and they wind up in prison, and yet they bought a lot of the things that they get mad at them for playing with and using. Come on, am I preaching somebody? Hey, man, get mad because Susie came out and she looked like she didn't have nothing on the, like Sister Bartman said, to cover up a thimble and then get mad about it. Hey, man, and mama bought it for Come on, somebody. I'm just preaching to you. Come on now. Hey, man, what I'm telling you is uh, sometimes you got to be the one to make decisions. Say, listen, there's some changes that are going to take place uh, in this house. Uh, we're not the same family anymore. We're not. The, we're saved now. We're not the same people we used to be. No, we're not going to that party over there. You know what they're going to be doing. No, we're not living over there. No, we're not going to that store. No, we're not watching that movie because that don't glorify God. I'm not going to say around and put trash into what God has purified. Can you say my? That's holiness preaching, folks. We need to look at ourselves and understand that the reason why that our spiritual life is a lot of times bankrupt is because our home environment has become a trash can for everything and junk. I've had my kids before say, Dad, can we watch this movie? No. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be cross. But I don't want that spirit in my house. Well, it's only one witchcraft scene. I don't care. That's 
Find something else out of the 10 billion movies that's been produced. And if you can't find nothing to watch, turn it off. That'd be too hard, wouldn't it? Preach about the second environment. I'm getting close to being done. Those of you that are already mad at me. <laughs> the second environment is our church environment. Y'all listening to me? I've seen countless people over the years out of loyalty and other, other reasons stay in a church that had a spiritually dead atmosphere and either become stagnant or die altogether. Now listen to me. Don't use this as an excuse to church hop. Huh? Listen to me. God wants you to be current with His will in your life. I want to ask you one straight, easy to understand question. When is the last time you asked God if you were in His will? You know what I find? There are some people that use this as an excuse, as I said. I'm not preaching about that crowd. I don't have time for that. We'd be here two more hours. So let me preach it this way. I find that when I'm not in God's will, or God's beginning to transition and do something in my life, I feel cramped. I feel miserable. I feel like something ain't right. I've felt that feeling before and come to find out it was just God trying to get my attention to get in the altar and start praying. But a lot of times that cramped feeling is when God is doing like you've heard me preach before about that eagle. She builds her nest. And when she builds that nest, she builds it with figs and twigs and thorns and different things that she puts in there. But some say they'll build the nest with thorns. And she'll put thatch or whatever over the thorns. And whenever it's time for the eagles, eaglets to get out of the nest, she uncovers the thatch so the little tender eaglet feet begin to get poked by the thorns and thereby causing them to want to jump out of the nest. Sometimes God's saying, listen, it is time for you to begin to listen to me. I'm trying to show you, you've been in this nest so long, and it's been time for you to fly. It's been time for you to soar. I've been waiting to do some big things in your life, but you're content to stay in the nest. Sometimes you got to realize God's doing something for a reason. Can you say amen? You see, in our church environment, Amen. It blessed my heart tonight. A young lady, she come to me, and I don't know her name yet. I'll have to say it four or five times, and probably I might get it right. You know what I mean? But the little young girl came to me tonight, and she said, Can I sing? I said, Sure. Sing right now. She said, Uh-uh. <laughs> A few minutes later, I come walking by. She said, Can I sing tonight? I said, Yeah, sure. You see, whenever you're hungry... Whenever you're thirsty and whenever you want God bad enough, you're not going to wait on somebody else. Come on now. I'm not talking about knocking down the door. But when you get ready to obey God, you're ready to branch out and you're tired of living in circles. You're tired of being root bound. You're tired of living the life that you're living and you're ready to spread your wings and begin to fly and experience God in a way like you haven't in a long time. You get tired of being so bound up, so cramped, so miserable, tired of feeling dead and dry and stale. You're going to do something about it. You might just go to the preacher and say, Preacher, Caleb and Devin, y'all listen to me. You might go to the preacher and say, Preacher, I'm, I've got the preacher itch. I need to preach. I need to preach the word. I'm on fire. I got a message. I got to preach. Amen. Can I tell you, when you're not root bound, that's the way you're going to be. You know why? Because you're eat up with the zeal of the Lord and you just want to obey God. I got a song I want to sing. Can I sing? Huh? I gotta sing. Huh? 
You see, Sister Myers and I went through a tragic event a few years back, several years back. We were pastoring a little church, and one of the people in our church got involved in some junk, shouldn't have been involved in, and it nearly wrecked the entire church. So my wife and I, we decided because we went through such a difficult time, you ever think pastoring's an easy thing? Just try it. For real. Huh? My wife made a statement. I will never, I don't ever ask me to pastor another church because she got hurt so bad. People can be cruel, mean, heartless. And so were they to Jesus too. But they were mean and nasty. So my wife and I, we took some time off. We went, eventually we wound up going over and sitting under the ministry of Gary Phillips and his wife. That was whenever we got to know Sister Tracy a little bit there. But while we were at that church, the pastor of the church, I went to him when we first went. I said, listen, I know that you may want to use us in certain things, but I said, I'm going to ask a special thing of you. I said, I don't want to do anything for a while. I said, I need to take a little bit of rest. I said, my wife and I have been going wide open, trying, trying, trying. I said, we need a little bit of time of restoration and healing. Several months had gone by, I don't know, maybe a year. One day I was talking to the pastor, and I told him we were riding along in his Corvette. <laughs> he had let me out near the front of my house, and we were sitting there talking right before I got out. And uh, he said, so how you feeling, Brother Myers, about, you know, maybe doing something in the Lord? I said, Brother, I said, I'm about to die. <laughs> he laughed at me. He, he was a fun person to be around. He laughed at me. He said, what do you mean? I said, man, I'm sitting on the pew. I said, I come to church sometime. Now, you got to imagine, I'm used to preaching revivals, sometimes two or three weeks at a time every single night, pastoring a church full-time, preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday or Thursday night, sometimes going off preaching revivals for different people. And now here I am just sitting on church pew. I was about to die. Matter of fact, I think Brother Smith or Sister Smith told me, I don't know what it was a year or so ago, said, Brother Smith, anytime you want to preach, he's really, he's, he's wanting to preach. He wants to preach, you know. And that don't bother me none. That makes me feel good. But I told Pastor uh, Phillips, I said, Brother, I'm about to die. I said, I sit through some church, church services, the whole entire service, and all I, I don't even get asked to pray over the offering. All that bottled up inside of me, I'm like, He's preaching, and all I'm wanting to do is jump up and quote a scripture or something. Sometimes I'm watching him preaching, and he's coming my way, and I'm thinking, yeah, pass it to me, pass it to me. <laughs> Give it to me. Give <laughs> yeah, it me. I'll preach a little bit. Oh, I'm feeling it inside. If, you don't, if you're not really called, you wouldn't understand that. But you eat up with the zeal of the Lord, and you're tired of being cramped, tired of being like that. I told him, I said, man, I'm ready to go right now. He said, I know you are. He said, but your wife ain't ready. <laughs> Figures. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, let me tell you something, folks. There came a time when God said, cast out your nets. <laughs> came a time whenever God said, okay, you've been ankle deep. You've been loin deep, knee deep. But you remember whenever that angel came along and led Ezekiel out into the waters, he finally got to the place where he said, and he led me into waters to swim in. You see, I felt like for two years, I was like a kid, singing in the rain, I splashing and, you know, flip-flopping around and everything. But, man, let me tell you, whenever God opened up the opportunity and I got the pastor again, I was doing basketball. I'm in waters to swim in. I've been bound and cramped up. I got both barrels loaded. Where's the church at? It's time to serve the Lord. Can I tell you, you don't need a pep rally. What you need is get back on fire for God and help you to understand it's time to serve God. You've been laying to the side and playing church long enough. Get back on the potter's wheel. Get on fire for God and do everything God called you to do. 
Huh? All them songs you wrote, hey man, I want to hear them sing even more. Did a fantastic job. Everybody say amen. Hey man, when I see, hey man, the little hands will begin to write songs and getting ready to sing. Hey man, every single young person, are y'all hearing me? There is something you can do in the Lord. Stop waiting on the pastor to give you a phone call. Well, if the pastor calls me at 1205 and he asks me to go to the church and clean and vacuum, I'll know it's you, Lord. I'll know it's you that wants me to sing that special song. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be funny because I'm preaching long in that way that you stay here with me. <laughs> Folks, in reality, that church environment should be an environment that you could thrive in. We need to complement one another. And I don't necessarily mean like, Man, that's a good-looking shirt. You got to compliment one another's ministries. There's no big eyes, no little U's. Everybody working in unity together, and you come along and say, "You got a good voice. You need to keep using it." Don't let the devil mislead you into thinking that all of life is building homes and houses and cars and fancy clothes and all of that. Because if you die tomorrow, you can't put that in the casket. But I tell you what you can get up here on this platform and that what you can get in these altars and what you can get, get sitting on the pews of a church, it'll outdo anything you can get in this world. Sure, we got to live. Sure, we got to put food on the table. But don't you ever put the things of this world before the things of God because you'll become spiritually bankrupt. But you make up your mind. You say, you know what? I felt something. Now, let me ask you a question. Now, if it's the other way, I'm be, I'll accept it. But did you feel anything when you sung up there? Did you feel something? Where did you feel it? Right in here? Feel it in here? Did it make you feel good? You know, that feeling you get is the feeling of satisfaction in knowing that you're doing something that God would be pleased in. Amen. Why wouldn't we all want to feel that? Come on now. You might be backwards and bashful, and that's fine. We can work with backwards and bashful. That's all right. You may not like to be in the front row. You may not like to be on the center stage. We can work with that. But just get on the stage. Come on. Just get in the altar. Don't let the devil defeat you and beat you out of a blessing. Because if you don't mind, the devil will take everything you got. I mean, tonight says, you know what? Like you're sitting here, I feel something. And I may not understand everything I feel, but I feel like God's wanting to do something in our youth group. Any young people feel like God wants to do something in the youth? Anybody in the adults say, I feel like God's wanting to send a revival to the Great Street Church of God. And all it's going to take is for somebody to obey the Lord. Amen. All God's waiting on is somebody to say, I'm tired of being rude, bell. I'm tired of being cramped. We have a Holy Ghost service. Young people are worshiping God. The Spirit of God's moving. Bound up. Come on. There are some services where it should just be a dynamic Holy Ghost eruption. But because we let the devil bind us up. Well, somebody said I can't sing. I had a pastor talk crazy to me one time. He heard my feelings, and I just ain't going to worship God no more. Somebody met me at the front door, and they told me that they don't like flowers on their dress, but flowers looked okay on mine, but they didn't care for it bound and you can't worship God service is going you're feeling the presence of God and you're sitting here like this in a few yep. Yep. man right now five years ago I'd have ran five years ago I'd have been dancing across that platform five years ago I'd obey God five years ago I'd have just I'd have cut loose and I'd have, I'd have break dance right across the front of this church five years ago because I felt the freedom 
it's easy to worship when you free, feel free. But when you feel bound, it's everything you can do. Praise the Lord. And if it ain't just that, one last thing I'm going to preach to you for those of you that are dying for me to finish is the third thing. Environment is your social environment. 20, 30 years ago, I probably wouldn't have had to mention internet social. But even on the internet, the people that you're interacting with every day, can have such a negative influence on you. You're trying to be chaste and pure, and he keeps saying, come on now, it's all right. Come on now, God understands. I mean, be real. Or you got that one friend that says, you got a headache? I got 14 bottles of oxycodone. No, I don't think I will because God delivered me from that from three weeks ago. Well, honey, if you change your mind. Matter of fact, I think I got some delighted too. Am I still preaching? That's everyday life. Oh, come on now. It'll be all right. It ain't going to hurt anything. Is that what the devil did in the garden? All right, let me preach this, and then I'll have to hush, okay? Y'all hold me to it. If I don't hush, I'll just say, all right, listen. Hey, Amen. Listen. Do you remember? Some of you heard me preach this before, and I'm going to try to preach this out, and I'm close. Y'all stand, and that'll help me feel like I got to close. <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard when you feel like you just your heart's full. It's hard to preach and just shut it down. I mean, but listen, in, in the Garden of Eden, you want to be Eve? You feel like being Eve tonight? Come here, Eve. Boy, everybody blames everything on Eve. You see, the serpent comes up, and he begins to challenge Eve about what God said. God said that you can have everything. You can have it all. But that one tree you're not allowed to partake of. And so the devil says... Thou shalt not surely die. You see, I know that preacher's been telling you that, but you know people's in church, and they do stuff like that all the time. Who cares what that preacher said? That's the kind of stuff the devil will come at you with. But you see, on that day, you won't die. And so he's trying to persuade her that it's okay. Her first mistake, y'all listening? Her first mistake is she's listening to him. Am I right? Her first mistake is entertaining the thought. But you know what? She entertains the thought, and guess what happens? Nothing. What do you mean? I mean, God didn't strike her dead for thinking about it, you know. So it was okay to think about it because nothing happened. So he says, I mean, come on, you know, take a bite. Get you one. I don't know if it was an apple or not, but let's say for sake of example, it was an apple, okay? So what I want you to do, you've already thought about it. Nothing happened. So she raises her hand. I want you to raise your hand. Nothing happened. You're thinking to yourself, I wonder what it's going to taste like. So you reach up and you get a hold of it. You get it in your hand. Nothing happened. She twisted it. Nothing happened. She pulled it off the tree. Nothing happened. She put it to her mouth. Nothing happened. She bit into it. And nothing happened. But after she bit into it, the consequences came. That's right. A lot of people mistake God's seal of approval in all the nothing happened. That's right. 
Well, if God was, if he was going to punish you, he'd, uh, he wouldn't have let it happen or he wouldn't have allowed the opportunity or you wouldn't have been in that position and you, nothing happened. It usually doesn't happen during the process anyway. That's the kind of stuff that next month, whenever she calls you and says, uh, we have a problem. <coughs> what? I think I'm pregnant. You see, last month, nothing happened. Right. This month, am I making sense? Sure. What I'm telling you is, the people and the way you interact socially is causing, just follow me, is causing a lot of folks to be root bound. You don't want your friends to stop thinking you're cool. So when you go to church, you're going to put on the church face, act churchy, act cool at church. Oh, yo, yo, fist bump the church, yo, youth, what's up? Huh? And then you get out here with the other crowd, and oh, you talk dirty, and I'm not talking about you, okay, so don't think that. Talk nasty, and you think it's all right to act up, cut the fool, and do stuff that ain't right. And yet somehow you think God's pleased with that, and your roots are bound. I'm telling you something tonight. Until you break this cycle right here, and until you fall on your knees before the Lord and say, God, I'm tired of living like this. Not a lot's going to change. You can be seated, sis, while everybody stands. What do you want? It's your choice. God was good enough to give you the power of choice. Somebody here tonight may say, Pastor Myers, I felt cramped, I felt miserable, and I feel like I don't know what to do. I'm supposed to be doing something. Don't jump to conclusions, please. But I'm asking you to pray. Sister Tracy, will you come to the piano, please, for just a few minutes? Play something. This is your choice. I can't make you serve the Lord. But like a cook in a kitchen, sis, all I can do is I can try to make the food look good enough and try to make it well enough so that whenever it comes to the table, it smells good enough that people say, you know what, that smells good. I want a bite of that. Give me some of that over there. The aroma is called conviction, the anointing. And tonight here, there are some of you that maybe have been struggling with a lot of things in your life and you've been feeling miserable. And you've been wondering why that you feel like you go to church and it's the same old monotonous routine. God has talked to you tonight and told you why. You're going to have to change your home environment. You're going to have to change your church environment. And you're going to have to change your social environment. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed all over. I'm going to ask you tonight, what are you going to do? Are you going to make that forward motion to say, God, tonight I'm ready for some change in my life. I'm tired of things being like this. I'm ready for a change. He's loving enough to open up his arms and accept you. Take you into his bosom. Show you his perfect will. But I'm asking us tonight, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed tonight, how many would say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Lord, I've made some mistakes. I've let you down in a lot of ways. But tonight I'm going to ask, please, show me mercy. God, show me mercy. Lord, I understand why now that our family seems to be stuck going through the motions. I understand now why things are the way that they are. As a family, we're going to have to pull together. You may have to go to your wife or your children and say, come on, let's get it together. We failed God in so many ways, but let's not live in the past. Let's put it on the altar tonight, and let's get where we need to be. The decision's yours. Come on, everyone that will. I'm not going to beg you to come. If you want to get closer to God, that'll be your decision tonight. You say, I'm tired of being root-bound. I'm tired of feeling like I'm growing, but growing in circles. God, I need you to break up the fallow ground of my heart. God, take the roots and separate them, God, so that I can start growing again. I can start doing what you called me to do in the first place.